Hello again, it is Jenny, and we are going to get started yet on another topic. This one is cyclogenase inhibitors, and think of that as COX-1 and COX-2, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and acetaminophen. So when we think of cyclogenase inhibitors, COX-1 and COX-2, they encompass the NSAIDs, which is your non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and the acetaminophen um, category. All right, again, think of that umbrella. We got the cyclogenase inhibitors on the top and then the um, two under that. All right, so before I get started on the slideshow, I want to show you a picture here and read, just kind of study the picture, but this is basically side effects. But um, what I want to get through is the cyclogenase, and um, what these do is there's COX-1 and COX-2. There's some drugs that are out there, NSAIDs, underneath that, that will work on COX-1 only. Most of them are COX-1 and 2, and some are very selective at COX-2 inhibitors, okay? All of them have benefits, and all of them have some adverse reactions to it. But I just want to give you a little bit of history starting at the aspirin because aspirin's been around. Actually, it was first marketed by Bayer Company. I don't know if you've heard of Bayer Aspirin before, but I do at my age in 1897. So that's a long time ago. Um, and it's what it really, the, the fancy term is acetyl, acetyl salicylic acid. So it's one of our oldest medications. Um, and... So it used to be, so in its parent compound is much older even. So since Hippocrates, the ancient Egyptians, they used willow bark, which contains salicylates to treat fever and pain. So over the past hundred years, aspirin um, has made its way into every medical chest in America. So, um, or I should say medicine cabinet now, or a um, kitchen cupboard or whatever, wherever you're going to put it, your car. <laughs> so things sure have changed. Um, now, while aspirin back in the 70s used to be used for basically pretty much everything. I had aspirin. My mom used to um, uh, take a spoon and dilute it with water and melt it and put sugar in it, and that's what I would take. Well, they found that aspirin can cause Rye syndrome in children, which is a dangerous um, illness and so now we don't give aspirin and there's much better things out there. Um, but what about uh, protecting your heart? So actually what happened was is in the 1940s this physician called, his name was Dr. Craven, he advised all his male patients between 40 and 65 to take aspirin every day. His goal was to prevent coronary thrombosis, clots in the heart arteries. And so he had observed that Few of his patients had heart attacks or stroke. Um, so, in 1989, a Harvard physician's health study um, was, they did a large health study with 22,000 men. Because, you know, back there and then in the 40s, we really didn't have a lot of the research laws, and this is really was more anecdotal, but thought there was something going on. But they did 20, a study on 22,000 men between 40 and 84. They took a 325 milligram aspirin, that's your standard dose, um, or they took a placebo medication. So it's your randomized control trial study, uh, meaning that one gets a placebo and the other gets the real thing and they don't know what they get. So over the next five years, they were being watched and the men taking the aspirin had 44% fewer heart attacks than their peers taking the placebo. So that would make this aspirin a huge winner <laughs> Um, over the years, they have found that really 81 milligrams is just as efficient as taking the 325. So now for cardio protection, for heart protection, uh, it, you'll see many older people take aspirin at 81 milligrams. So how does this protect the heart? What is COX-1? What's this? Uh, and we'll talk about COX-1 and 2, but what's this COX-1? So Actually, we'll talk about both COX-1 and COX-2. So try to stay with me on this, <laughs> okay? All right, so the long answer is a bit complicated, uh, but I think it's really important to explain 
uh, the side effects as well of its as well as its benefits. So the aspirin's actions begin with this with its effects on two important enzymes. So that's cyclogenase one, that's COX one, and then we have cyclogenase two. So think of COX one as housekeeping enzyme because it's present in many tissues. It helps maintain various functions. For the most part, COX-1 does its job by stimulating a family of chemicals called, called prostaglandulins. So there's a particular prostaglandulin <clears throat> called thromb thromboxane A2. All right, thromboxane A2, it's the glue that makes your platelets stick together and form clots, because remember, clots are formed by platelets. So by inhibiting COX-1, the aspirin, by taking the aspirin, it interrupts this chain of events and reduces the risk of heart attacks. Since platelets also trigger good clots, all right, that help prevent bleeding from, like, say, if you get cut, aspirin can also increase bleeding, whether you, like, are shaving and have a nick while shaving or a serious wound. All right, so I hope that makes sense. So it's a little component off that um, prostaglandulin. <clears throat> prostaglandulins are basically very important with COX-1 and COX-2. Prostaglandulins are in the stomach lining, gastric blood flow, and they produce acid neutralizing bicarbonate and they protect the mucus. So by inhibiting COX-1, aspirin reduces those prostaglandulins that protect the stomach and so that's why you have an increased risk of bleeding and ulcers. So the prostaglandulins help, but if you're inhibiting it, you're removing that prostaglandulin. Prostaglandulins also help regulate kidney function and blood flow. So by inhibiting the COX-1, aspirin can reduce these protective chemicals, which can raise your blood pressure or reduce your kidney function, especially more in the elderly or patients with kidney disease. So I hope you're understanding the COX-1. So if COX-1 is a housekeeping enzyme, COX-2 is more of a troubleshooter, all right? So instead of hanging around in healthy cells and tissues, it gets fired up in response to assaults such as infection and inflammation. Those are COX-2 inhibitors. COX-2 generates chemicals that trigger fever and pain. Drugs that inhibit COX-2 do a nice job of reducing pain and lowering high temperatures, but COX-2, it's not all that bad. It also produces prostacyclin. So that's a chemical that widens arteries and fights blood clotting. So drugs that inhibit COX-2 may increase the risk of heart attack and stroke by reducing the prostacyclin. So as you can see, there's good and bad to both of these. So that is why the selective COX-2 inhibitors, such as Celebrex, Viax was um, a, also out there, but that's been taken off the market since. Um, and then also Bextra, that was removed from the market. But Celebrex still remains on the market, but requires really extreme care. It's also why many of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, your NSAIDs, that inhibit both the COX-1 and COX-2 have more of a mixed reputation. So is it good for the heart? Is it bad for the heart, et cetera? So remember COX-1 and COX-2, all right? Remember with COX-1, there's the prostaglandulins, all right? That's the glue that makes the platelets stick. And that's why you take the aspirin. Aspirin is a COX-1 inhibitor that helps prevent those platelets from sticking, therefore preventing heart issues. COX-2 is the troubleshooter, meaning I think, I think of COX-2 as just uh, troubleshooting like fevers and inflammation. It's a good drug. It does that. But remember it also, COX-2 also works well in your body um, by producing the prostacyclin. And that widens your arteries and fights blood clotting. But so if you're taking a COX-2 inhibitor, it's going to lower that prostacyclin. So that can increase your risk of having heart attacks. All right, I know that was kind of long, but I wanted that for you to make, um, have better sense of what that is. And as you can see here on this, these um, basically show what um, I had said, how it works in the kidney, cardiovascular, and GI mucosa. So it's good and bad. All right, so let's get the slideshow started here.
Um, these can be, let me get my screen wider here. Um, CACS 1 and CACS 2 can be a little bit confusing, and so that's why I'm trying to explain it the best I can. Oh my lord. Got it. I had to take a break. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about my oh my lord. <laughs> I'm not used to recording on my Big Mac, Big Mac, that my Mac computer that I have at home, and so it's trying to get my screen as large and then this other screen small. So, all right. So first generation NSAID. So I hope now my explanation, um, you can listen to it again, helps that um, explanation as we go on. So the first generation NSAIDs. Those inhibit COX-1 and COX-2. Remember when we talked about selective medications in the last um, video on antihistamines, how there's some are selective that cross the blood-brain barrier, some don't? Well, that's antihistamines. COX-1 and COX-2, some NSAIDs will treat both. So that's not that selective. So it's basically um, inhibiting both COX-1 with the prostaglandulins and the COX-2 with the uh, prostacyclines. So remember how the, I said the jury's kind of out whether these can cause both stomach issues because it reduces that lining on the stomach, kidney issues, and whether it can also cause heart issues because of the prostacycline. So this is first generation NSAIDs, and I'll show you a, a list of it. There's so many of them out there. It's just unbelievable and to the point of overwhelming actually and how do you know which one to choose well we try to go with safety but again some of these are you just have to tailor it and pa patients with chronic pain and like migraines and things like that um, sometimes it's just trying to pick off the list if they're younger and seeing how they tolerate it but we really try to keep these patients on these NSAIDs short term just because it does have other than aspirin just because the others have such risk to it. All right, next slide here. So these are Jenny's slides, so I'm not sure. So non-selective inhibitor of cyclogenase, which we did talk about, that was aspirin. It's therapeutic uses as a willow tree. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Maybe because, um, um, it was used from a salicylate is in willow bark, so I bet you that is why. Remember, I mentioned that in the beginning. It's a very interesting story. But, okay, its therapeutic uses are for cardiovascular uh, protection to help reduce clots. Aspirin, and it helps um, with the um, prostaglandulins, uh, which causes GI side effects, but also it um, is a platelet um, it inhibits your platelets from clumping together to cause a clot. So, and also side effects of bleed, which we'll talk about also on this slide. So what are the side effects? Um, over age 65, we recommend most people take um, a daily baby aspirin a day. A baby aspirin is 81 milligrams or, um, uh, or 10 grains of aspirin, but you'll see 81 milligrams. So some of these side effects, you're gonna see ringing in the ears. Um, if you see ringing of the ears, that means that they're probably taking too much. You'll only see this in aspirin. You won't see this in any of the other um, medications that we're going to talk about today. None of the NSAIDs. So ringing in the ears is very specific to aspirin. Uh, you can have nausea, stomach pain, heartburn, and vomiting. And why? Because remember that it's reducing the prostaglandulins that protect your stomach. All right, so also wheezing, difficulty breathing, hoarseness, fast breathing. That would be more just an allergic response that your body's not responding to aspirin. And so aspirin, um, I can't say it's a common allergy, but it's more common than some of the other medications that are out there. Fast heartbeat, cold, clammy skin, hives, rash, um, and bright red blood and stools, black or tarry stools. So it'd be easy to understand why they're having um, bright red blood in stools because their platelets aren't clumping together so they can internally bleed so you can have an issue. If you have black or tarry stools it's most likely coming from the stomach here because when you think about that it 
say you have bleeding going on in your stomach from an ulcer, it's going to be red here, but by the time it gets through your GI system, it turns black because it's di going through all the digestive enzymes and stuff. So black and tarry stools are not good. If it's bright red blood, usually it's something that's more in the distal colon is bleeding, which can also happen. And so the, this aspirin has drug interactions just because it's working with the platelets. So if you take warfarin or if you're on heparin in the hospital, um, a lot of people, I mean, you shouldn't really be on aspirin and either of those because you're going to have an increased risk of bleeding because they're both working in different ways on your blood clotting um, factors. So here's some non-aspirin first generation NSAIDs. Um, again, I'll show you a list, but let's just, we're talking about them in general. They're aspirin-like drugs, but they have fewer GI renal and hemorrhagic effects than the aspirin. So there's over 20 NSAIDs out there, but just one to think about is ibuprofen. Um, they're all similar, but we don't know why. Some people like ibuprofen, some people like naproxen, some people like diclofenic, some pe you know, so it just depends and we really don't know why. They inhibit COX-1 and COX-2. The inhibition is reversible, unlike with a aspirin. So um, you take the COX-1, it goes through your system, and then um, that it's reversible, basically. It goes back to normal. With aspirin, you just continue to take it, and you have that increase. It doesn't reverse that easily, which is why if you're going to surgery, you really need to stop your aspirin a week before surgery because on day three, you, your blood's probably still thin. Whereas these usually will go out of your system a little bit quicker, although with surgery we tell people to stop it anyways. The principal indicators are for rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis, and they don't protect against heart attacks and stroke, which we talked about the pathophysiology of that in the beginning. Oh, and here's a list. Okay, first generation NSAIDs. NSAIDs, there's so many of them. Um, just to go down the list, like this naproxen is your leave over the counter, but plus, plus lansoprazole, that's with Prevacid. So now they've come out with these, because it's not good for your stomach, they have come out with ones with um, antipeptic ulcer medications, such as Prevacid, to help protect the stomach if you're taking naproxen more on a regular basis. All of these things we really don't want people taking long term. Do we see it? Yes, we see it. We have to be really careful. It's very difficult, especially with the elderly. We see a lot of GI bleeds. Um, so a lot of these are even older drugs, indomethacin. Uh, you see ketorolac is, you, you will see in the hospital if you not have already seen it, it's toradol. So you can give that um, IV or IM. It's also oral, but it's really not recommended to be taken at home. It's a pretty potent medication. Meloxicam, um, diclofenic. So any, anyways, just know that these are COX-1 and COX-2. They're not very selective, and the jury's still out as far as what's better than another to take for heart to um, have the lowest risk of heart issues, et cetera. Your second generation NSAIDs are very much more focused. It's a COX-2 inhibitor, and that's your Celebrex. So it's just as effective, um, but it does have a lower risk for GI side effects. So that's your Celebrex, and I mentioned before Vioxx, and there was one other one, but they got taken off the market. So these are second generation COX-2 inhibitors, meaning they're just selective. They're working right on the COX-2 inhibitor, uh, right on the COX-2 prostaglandulin or prostacycline. Fewer adverse effects in the first generation, but remember COX-2 reduces the process, prostacycline um, that helps with your um, blood vessels. And so now if you put an inhibitor in there, now you have an increased risk of cardiovascular issues. So, um, but again, we have to watch the patient and see what the risk factors are. Uh, but it's last choice drug for long-term management of pain. We really try not to give that. So it's very difficult with um, pain. You know, we have narcotics. We don't want to give narcotics now. We have NSAIDs like these. We don't want to give these. So there, there's side effects to everything. And, and just because they're over the counter doesn't mean they're safe. And a lot of people think that because they're over the counter, it's safe. Now, this one's a prescription. But if we go back to the other list here, 
Ibuprofen is over the counter, naproxen is over the counter, um, and uh, that's it. But still, people take these like they're candy. At least I'm generalizing, obviously, not everybody does, but. All right, so what can some adverse effects be? Burping, which is your dyspepsia, and just like ugh, your stomach's not feeling right, abdominal pain, renal toxicity, and sulfa allergies you have to um, be very careful with. Um, and you do not want to give in pregnancy. I would just say again, don't be given this in pregnancy at all. <clears throat> As far as um, pregnancy with this medication, yeah, you don't give in pregnancy at all. I believe you can breastfeed, though, but I'll have to look that up. Um, but just know not to use in pregnancy. And it's going to have your obvious drug interactions like warfarin because that's going to thin the blood. It can also decrease the diuretic effect of furosemide, so good to keep that in mind. may decrease antihypertensive effect of an ACE inhibitor may increase lithium levels. So lithium is for bipolar disorder. Um, ACE inhibitors would be your lisinopril, quinopril. You don't have to know those, but just as you're going through clinicals, know that your Celebrex can have some interactions with some blood pressure medications, specifically the drug class of ACE inhibitor, and diuretics such as your Lasix or furosemide. And fluconazole, which is used for fungal infections, uh, the levels may be increased. All right, so Tylenol. Tylenol is kind of one of those, like, other ones that um, kind of falls into this but does not fall into, into this. So it's used as an analgesic and or fever reducer. It does not have any anti-inflammatory or anti-rheumatic action. So it's really not good for rheumatoid arthritis. It's not going to reduce inflammation. It's more for just reducing fever. Um, and mild pain, I would say. It's not associated with the Rye syndrome like the aspirin is. There's very few, but there's a patotoxicity. So it used to be that we could take uh, 4,000 milligrams or 4 grams a day of Tylenol. Well, now we know that it, um, it's causing hepatotoxicity even at that dosage. And so uh, 2, 3, maybe even longer than that, um, a new guideline came out that you should not go over 2 grams a day or 2,000 milligrams. So that would really be um, uh, 2 extra strength twice a day. And you have to watch, if you go to the drugstore, um, the pharmacy, and look at Tylenol arthritis, it comes in a higher dose. So again, they have to be careful because then if you take 2 twice a day, you're overdosing over the 2,000 milligrams. <laughs> A regular strength Tylenol is 325, an extra strength is 500, and the Tylenol arthritis, I believe, is like a 620, 650, 625. I'd have to look and see. Um, but you have to be real careful, especially with alcoholics. People who drink alcohol in general have to be careful. And again, interactions. Warfarin has interactions with just about every drug on the market. <laughs> so this does also interact with warfarin and alcohol we talked about. So most COX inhibitors, especially the COX-2 inhibitors, increase the risk for MI and stroke. That was from the American Heart Association. A stepped care approach means start low and go slow. Really be careful who you're giving your medication to. So here's a little case study. Mrs. Y, who is an 80-year-old patient, has a history of hypertension, CAD, and RA. She is participating in a wellness health fair for which she volunteered. Now her exam, her vitals are pretty good. And let's see. And then she just has some normal changes of aging. So Ms. Y tells you that she's upset. She said, I went to Dr. H for years. He told me to take aspirin until I felt better. And that was all I needed to do to keep my arthritis under control. So do you think that aspirin was the best choice for her arthritis? And does she think she's taking it for her arthritis? Or is that really why Dr. H is having her take it? So there's all these variables now that come in. It's like, well, she's 80. She probably maybe should be on a baby aspirin. Uh, she has coronary artery disease, right? Is it really gonna help her rheumatoid arthritis? Probably not the best medication for it, but. 
Recently, I had to switch to a new doctor when Dr. H retired. Now I'm taking two different drugs to help my arthritis. I don't think this new doctor knows what he's talking about. Dr. H was right. Aspirin's the best way to treat arthritis. So how would you best answer that? Well, we kind of kind of just said that. Aspirin is really for cardiovascular uh, protection. So since she has coronary artery disease, that's probably why she's on the aspirin. And so he probably gave her something else for her arthritis, but I don't know what that is. Um, I would probably look at her medication list and say, can I see your medication list and um, uh, let's take a look and see what medications you're on because I'm not sure what other one he would give her for her arthritis. Now, if she's already on aspirin, you don't want to give another NSAID um, because that would um, be an interaction and um, obviously have some side effects or it would increase your risk of adverse effects. Remember with the bleeding and cardiovascular, if you're giving another type of NSAID. So since she has coronary artery disease, aspirin is good, so I don't know what she's on. So it says up here, which is blocked off for me, but Mrs. Y asked, why do you suppose the new doctor took me off aspirin? Why can't he find a drug that works for me? So that, I don't know. I mean, I would probably have to look at her history and question why she's taken off aspirin. Maybe he put her on another uh, medication. Um, like Plavix or something, I, I don't really know, but she shouldn't even be put on that. So I would question why she's taken off aspirin unless she's had a GI bleed in the past. Does she have some kidney issues going on? Is that why he took her off aspirin? You have to weigh the risks and the benefits. So if she's had a GI bleed, the risk of having another GI bleed is very high. So you have to weigh that with the risk of having another cardiac event. So it's very, it's a very fine balance. So Ms. Ms. Y is concerned about her cardiac health. She tells you, when I was on aspirin, it helped my heart and my arthritis. If the new, if the new drug, this Celebrex, so now we know she, Celebrex, is so much better than aspirin, why can't it help my heart like the aspirin does? So Mrs. Y asks you whether it's completely safe. So what would you tell them? Tell Ms. Y. Um, well, Celebrex, you can't say any medication is completely safe because everything comes with side effects. And we do know that uh, Celebrex is really not going to protect her heart, right? The aspirin is going to protect her heart. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, the Celebrex is going to protect her stomach more. It's not going to protect it, but it's going to reduce that side of that adverse reaction of having a GI bleed. But now what does it do? It increases her coronary heart risk. And if she already has coronary artery disease, I may just question it. Maybe she's just putting on, put on it for a short term, but... I would still question that. I would call the physician and ask. This one says a 46-year-old patient is two days post-op from a fractured ankle that was repaired with internal fixation. He has a history of alcohol cirrhosis and 30 pounds overweight. In addition to the IV antibiotics, he's receiving acetaminophen for pain and fever reduction. So we know acetaminophen is Tylenol. What factors, if any, in the history would cause the nurse to question the order for acetaminophen? Um, so that would be probably the alcohol intake, right? So if you look, never lets me back here. If I go back to the last slide here, he has alcoholic cirrhosis. He's overweight, which means he probably has a fatty liver also with the alcohol cirrhosis. And we know that Tylenol or acetaminophen is metabolized in the liver can cause hepatotoxicity. We don't want him taking any Tylenol. So it looks like he was discharged home on Tylenol. Uh, over the next few days, the patient's two-year-old granddaughter was visiting. The child found the bottle and consumed 30 tablets. Well, that's not good. Uh, so yeah, that's another whole thing with medication safety. We think Tylenol, because it's over the counter again, we think it's probably safe, but any medication is not safe, especially if you're taking it in large doses and you need to keep them away from children. So what would you take? Well, years ago we used to do activated charcoal, but now it's more acetylcysteine. Mucomist is the other name, um, and that really helps um, get that drug out of the system. The home health nurse is following the patient at home. The patient is continuing to take Tylenol for pain. The patient's also showing these behaviors. Eating large amounts of green leafy vegetables, eating apples and bananas, 
for snacks, drinking six beers over two days, or taking an over-the-counter H2 antagonist. So which behavior would, co would cause the nurse the most concern? I would say six beers. Now, if someone was taking warfarin, the Coumadin, then yes, you don't want to be eating a lar lot of large green leafy vegetables. We're not on the warfarin topic, but um, warfarin, um, you don't want to take a lot of things with vitamin K in it because that will clot your blood and the warfarin then won't work. Bananas and apples aren't going to hurt and taking the over-the-counter um, H2 antagonist, and remember H2 antagonist we talked about before, that's your Pepsid, uh, your um, Zantac, Ranitidine for your stomach. Remember the H2 blockers? Uh, now those we would have to think about what type of drug he's taking. He's taking acetaminophen. Now if he was taking aspirin or ibuprofen, uh, more of a non-selective, they had the COX-1 um, portion, then I would say, yeah, um, you probably want to take the H2 agonist. So it's really not doing anything with Tylenol, but drinking six beers over two days is probably not a good idea. He already has alcohol cirrhosis and he's overweight. Now he's taking Tylenol. Okay, so I want to show you just a couple slides that I found. So here's just, and I know I showed you a little bit of a list on the slides, but if you look here, there's so many anti-inflammatories to pick from. You don't have to memorize them. Um, you have to know, I would say, your main ones, like your naproxen, uh, know what celecoxib is because it's that um, COX-2 inhibitor that's very selective. So that's the only one out on the market now. So I would say that you should know that. We showed that one already, showed that one. Um, now, I don't know if you can see this, but this is as big as I could get it. Um, here's it just kind of gives you an idea the more that you go selective with cox 2 over here You have increased cardiovascular effects, but less GI effects and over here you have increased GI effects But less cardiovascular effects because of the way it works in your body the prostacyclin and the prostaglandulin and this is just a selective cox 2 inhibition and how it enhances your cardiovascular risk so um, what it does, it binds to the platelets and the platelets end up sticking together. So these are your platelets right here. And as you can see, the platelets here are sticking together. And I think that's about it. Okay, so a couple things here that I just wanna go through is, let me get rid of this here. Hold on a second, get my thing bigger. All right, we're gonna go here. So one thing I wanted to talk about that wasn't in the slides is um, different forms of taking these medications. So um, most of these come in oral form, but some of them will come in IV. But one thing that we can do is take topical gel that's an anti-inflammatory, an NSAID. So diclofenic is one of those. Um, now, um, uh, Voltaren gel, diclofenic gel, it's the same thing. You probably will end up seeing that on patients' uh, drug lists. Uh, but the one thing, or the few things that you should know about this medication, it's still absorbed in the body, so you can still have um, issues such as um, liver toxicity and, um, you know, it, your GI thing. Now, it's not going through the GI tract, but remember, it still has some absorption, and we still are dealing with the same type of prostaglandulin, because that's exactly what the drug is doing, is blocking that. Um, the one thing, though, that you have to be careful, it's sensitive to the sun, um, so you want to make sure that you're covering the area. So say you're going out into the sun, out to the, the park or whatever, and it's sunny out, you want to make sure that that area is a uh, cover. Usually how you do that, it'll tell you to put like one inch um, on your arm um, and then you just cover it up. You can usually do it every four to six hours. Uh, the Voltaren gel, you say you put one inch, like say for knee pain, you just, you can rub it and you put the inch on and you'll rub it in, but you want to cover it up if it's going to be exposed to sun. Um, 
Now, it has the same toxicity as the oral formulation. Just remember that. It might be just a little less, but um, um, that can still happen. And then it is topical, so um, it will not cause liver toxicity like I said before. It did. No, it doesn't. So sorry about that. Okay. The main thing is, though, make sure that you cover it. Um, also, the other thing is, um, remember with aspirin, aspirin is very selective for the adverse reaction of tinnitus. The other ones don't really cause that, but aspirin can. And if that means that, or give you a hint that maybe they're taking too much of it. <clears throat> Okay. okay, and these are just some uh, little hints or tidbits on um, NSAIDs versus aspirin. So unlike aspirin, the first generation NSAIDs cause reversible inhibition of the cyclogenase. So remember that is the mechanism of action. Um, and so that's what first generation NSAIDs do. They re cause reversible inhibition, whereas aspirin is not reversible. NSAIDs do not increase the risk of myocardial infarction, which is a heart attack and stroke. However, unlike aspirin, they do not provide protective benefits against those conditions. All right, so they don't necessarily, that's hard with wording, but they don't necessarily increase your risk of stroke, but they don't provide any protective benefits against those conditions. Um, unlike aspirin, first-generation NSAIDs cause little or no suppression of platelet aggregation. And unlike aspirin, first-generation NSAIDs do carry a risk of hypersensitivity reaction. So remember, whether it's an aspirin, a first-generation NSAID, or even the COX-2 inhibitor, which is the second-generation NSAID, they all carry a risk of hypersensitivity reactions. So when you're thinking of aspirin versus the other ones, aspirin is kind of sets itself apart from the other ones um, in that the NSAIDs carry little or no suppression of platelet aggregation, whereas aspirin does. And when you're seeing somebody in the hospital that's been getting Toradol injections or oral, and oral medication of Toradol, when they go home, they usually should never go home on Toradol. It's just a very potent drug and um, has a lot of uh, or increased risk more so than some of the other ones of GI side effects. So it's really not a great drug to take at home. You have to be really careful. So it should be monitored while uh, they're in the hospital. Also think about, about um, what aspirin is doing, how it's preventing those platelets from clumping together, therefore you can have an increased risk of bleeding. So if anybody's having surgery, you want to make sure you stop that at least seven days before. Um, there are, there's no exact rule of thumb as if it needs to be five days before, seven or ten. It just depends on the person. If they have cardiovascular disease, you may want to, some, some surgeons will say five days before is fine. Usually they say five to seven days it takes for it to end up reversing itself. As far as aspirin, first generation NSAIDs and second generation NSAIDs, which would be your COX-2 inhibitor, do not take while you're pregnant, although you can take NSAIDs uh, while breastfeeding. Not necessarily any specific one, but NSAIDs in general, like ibuprofen, I'd probably be um, safer to give them ibuprofen. There is a program actually that you can look up. It's called LACTMED, L-A-C-T-M-E-D, and you can type in the drug and it'll tell you exactly if it's safe for breastfeeding or not. All right, and that wraps it up.